anyway, I'll um, pass you over to our speaker for today. Um, just a brief introduction to Dr. Laura Barker from Imperial College London. She's um, senior lecturer in the chemistry department at Imperial with a particular focus on plant chemical biology. Um, when I googled Laura, because we don't really know one another, um, I noticed that she has many links with industry, as well as something that caught my eye was um, her role, I'm not sure what it is, in the management team of Sainsbury's Farming Scholarship Programme. But it's only one thing in a very long list, actually, of, of many things that Laura is involved in. So um, I'll pass you over. Warm welcome, Laura, from everyone here. Well, thank you so much. Um, let me try and share my screen now and hope that everything goes to plan. There we go. Are you able to see my slides? That looks great. Perfect. Thank you so much. So good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for your very kind uh, and, and warm introduction, Rosemary. Um, it really is a, an absolute pleasure to uh, be talking to you um, today. Uh, uh, particularly during British Science Week. Um, as you said, my name is um, Laura Barter and I'm uh, a member of staff in the chemistry department at Imperial College London, as well as being uh, co-directors of two networks, um, Agrinet and the Agri Futures Lab. So there we go. Now, Rosemary asked if I would give you a brief um, introduction to uh, the route that I took to becoming uh, an academic at Imperial College. And I have to um, confess that I don't think I necessarily took the most traditional of routes because quite unusually, I stayed, have stayed at Imperial throughout the whole of my training and, and uh, research career, which really is um, quite unusual. I'll try and uh, explain to you the rationale though behind that decision as I talk to you a little bit about the path that I took. So as you um, can see, hopefully I took my BSc uh, degree in the chemistry department at Imperial College London, and I took my um, final year research project with a group that had been run by a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Professor Lord Porter, or Prof as we called him. And I have to say, he was a truly inspirational person. Um, he had actually just retired when I joined um, the group, but he was still very active in the science that was going on and um, very interested in the research that I was doing. And I think um, it really inspired me to want to stay uh, in science. My project was all about um, photosynthesis. And at the end of that, I decided that I'd like to continue to learn more about photosynthesis and to do a PhD. I was fortunate enough to get a um, funding to do a PhD in the biochemistry department at Imperial College. And I was co-supervised by two members of staff who were actually joint appointments between the um, uh, biochemistry, well, biology, biochemistry and um, chemistry departments. And again, I think this uh, introduction very early on into multidisciplinary ways of working really has stayed with me throughout. And I think and I hope that you'll see by the end of um, this presentation that it's um, a viewpoint that I think is really important in the research that uh, I'm doing. I think it's vital that we have inputs from uh, many different disciplines if we're really to make uh, big strides at, at addressing some of the key challenges that face society today. At the end of that, um, P my, at the end of my PhD, I decided I would um, do a postdoc in the molecular dynamics research group. And during that time, 
I um, learnt about um, some more spectroscopy tools. So during my PhD, I sorry, I should have said I, I studied um, photosynthesis, but I also learnt um, about optical spectroscopy and I got to play with lots of very um, cool tools that were able to take very fast snapshots and pictures of what was going on um, within plants. And when I went to do my postdoc, I thought I'd, I quite wanted to learn a new form of spectroscopy. So I decided I would study um, a form of two dimensional infrared spectroscopy. And, and the challenges that I was then addressing were really driven by um, the pharmaceutical industry and, and using it as a proteomic tool. But um, I quite soon on realized that actually that tool could have applications within the agrosciences. And so I decided that I would apply for a Royal Society University Research Fellowship, which is some funding that you can get to enable you to establish an independent career. And I was lucky enough to be awarded one. And it, it really um, enabled me to um, develop the research that I'm going to talk to you about um, today. At the end of that fellowship, I um, Got, uh, was an, uh, got taken on as a senior lecturer at Imperial College. And that's where, as I say, I'm, I'm running my own research group um, there at the moment. And aside from that, and I also wanted to mention, I'm also um, director of Agrinet as well as the um, AgriFutures Lab. And there are two networks that I wanted to mention to you today because um, it would be absolutely fabulous if any of you would be interested in becoming involved with those, uh, that network and taking part in any of the events that we um, run. But it also, I also wanted to mention it because I think it epitomizes a particular way of working that has both multidisciplinary research but also effective communication at its heart and that's because I believe that if we're going to be able to make a, a real impact on the challenge of food security then we're going to need to have and use multidisciplinary approaches as well as have effective science communication. Oops, let's see whether we can, there we go. So what do I mean in this context by food security? Well, the definition of, of food security is really all around um, both food supply in terms of quality and quantity. And why, why is this important? Well, we know that the world's population is predicted um, to increase by up to 9.1% billion by the year 2050 and so the world the, the food the fuel and the fiber needs of this rapidly expanding population is going to put enormous demands on agricultural productivity if we're to be able to produce both the quality and the quantity of the food that we require now it's predicted that by 2050, agricultural production is going to have to increase by an estimated 70% globally and by 100% in developing countries. And it's going to, it's, and it's clear if it's going to do this that we're going to have to increase or, or crop productivity is going to have to increase in a sustainable way. Now, what do I mean by sustainable? Well, I mean environmentally, socially and economically sustainable. And this, of course, is in the light of global climate change, as well as loss of land due to um, uh, urbanisation and soil degradation. Now, thanks to improvements over the past 50 years or so in agricultural tools and, and technologies and practices, uh, we've been able to um, meet the demands and, and these have been improvements have been made, for example, in developing um, high yielding crops uh, such as cereals in terms of irrigation, uh, efficient irrigation methods, as well as the development of novel agrochemicals. And we've been able to provide enough food to feed our expanding population. But worryingly, as we can see from this graph here, which is looking at the average annual yield of rice production in China, we're starting to see a plateau. These yield increases are, are starting to stagnate. 
And I think that, that what this is telling us is that we need to look to new strategies if we're to try to address this problem. <clears throat> so imagine the headline in 30 or so years time, crop yields double, food for all. Well, my research group and the, the people that I collaborate with are all interested in looking at how multidisciplinary approaches, namely through uh, the field of chemical biology, so that's at the interface between chemistry and biology, could really impact upon this particular challenge. So we believe that, that photosynthesis could provide an answer. Now, this um, slide shows some data that was taken by NASA, actually, and it's looking at chlorophyll absorbance. And you can see green in both um, the land and the sea. Now, I'm sure everyone uh, on this call today knows, but chlorophyll is, of course, the material that uh, allows plants to capture light energy from the sun and to convert it into a form of energy that it can use um, to grow. Now, the keen eyed monkey you may have spotted that there's quite a lot of green uh, uh, indicating quite a lot of photosynthetic activity in the oceans as well as on the land. And in fact, aquatic organisms are responsible for nearly half of the photosynthesis that takes place on this planet. Now, what I'm not sure whether you're aware of is that despite being one of the most important processes that takes place on the Earth, photosynthesis is actually a surprisingly inefficient process. With the conversion of light energy from the sun to stored biomass within the leaf being only of the order of one to 2% efficient. And I'm fascinated by trying to understand this inefficiency. And as I've said, and I'll keep saying, so do forgive me, but I do think that multidisciplinary approaches and chemical biology, as I've called it here, the chemical biology toolkit, is a way that we can try and unravel what's going on. So what do I mean, really? What, what are we talking about? So I, what, what, the approach that we're adopting is using a combination of both theory and experiment with the hope that we can gain a quantitative understanding of the structure function relationships that control all the different reactions that take place within photosynthesis and it's very complicated actually surprisingly so and very finely tuned and only if we have that level of understanding do i believe we will we be able to rationally design uh, methods to perturb the system and they could be to chemically perturb or genetically perturb and i happen personally to be very interested in the chemical approach but i think but it, it this sort of type of understanding is going to be vital whichever approach people take and if we uh, are able to do and to, to enhance photosynthesis efficiency, photosynthetic efficiency, because photosynthesis is directly proportional to crop yield, if we can enhance photosynthetic efficiency, we're going to be able to enhance crop yields. So let's take a little look at photosynthesis in a bit more detail to try to understand where these inefficiencies are occurring. What I show here in this slide is a cartoon of um, a chloroplast, which is where the photosynthetic reactions take place in higher plants. What you can see within this are what I've labelled as the, the thylakoid membranes. And they look, if you, if, I don't know whether you agree, but I think they look like stacks of coins, one on top of one another. And it's in those membranes, which you can see here, these are uh, electron micrograph that's been taken showing those membranes actually from a, 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 a plant. Um, uh, and it's in these stacked regions where the light driven reactions of photosynthesis occur. And this again is showing a cartoon of the chloroplast. And you can see here the light reactions are, uh, are indicated here. So what's happening during, during the light reactions of photosynthesis? Light energy, as I've said, is absorbed by uh, pigments, including chlorophyll and um, charge separation reactions occur which create uh, uh, the convert light energy into what i would call an energy currency that can then be used for 
further reactions, namely the carbon fixation reactions or the Calvin cycle of photosynthesis. Now, the light reactions are important because that is where water is split and oxygen is produced, which is, of course, the source of the oxygen that we find in the atmosphere that we need to breathe and to live. And as I said, the energy currency that is produced is used by the um, Calvin cycle enzymes or the carbon fixation reactions of photosynthesis, which take place in uh, the matrix that surround these uh, stacked regions of, of membranes, these stacked coins of the thylakoid membrane that I showed you. So it's interesting, actually, because the um, light reactions are actually generally pretty efficient. There are some ways that we could enhance them, but in principle, they're pretty efficient reactions. And in fact, scientists are very often trying to mimic them to make artificial systems, particularly that could uh, split water efficiently. Now, the dark reactions, the Calvin cycle or the carbon fixation reactions, they've got all these different names, but they amount to the same thing. This is, these are the reactions that capture carbon dioxide and effectively fix it into carbohydrate, which is, of course, the, the um, base of many um, food chains, the carbohydrate uh, that sits at the base of many food chains. And these, however, are uh, surprisingly inefficient reactions. And as I've said, you know, the typical conversion efficiencies are, are only of one to, order of one to two percent efficient. And one of the major culprits is this enzyme shown here called Rubisco. And just to, to reiterate, if given that there's a direct correlation between photosynthetic efficiency and crop yield, if somehow we were able to improve the efficiency of this enzyme, then we would be able to increase photosynthetic efficiency potentially and increase crop yield. So this is an image of Rubisco. And as I've said, it's one of the main culprits for um, the inefficiencies of photosynthesis. And it's involved in this capture of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now, Rubisco is a very large enzyme, really. And as you can see from this figure, it actually has eight large subunits that form a barrel all around the center here. And it's capped at the top and at the bottom by four subunits, small subunits at the top and four small subunits at the bottom. Now, Rubisco really is a lousy enzyme and it suffers on multiple fronts. So first of all, it's slow. Typical enzymes can catalyze thousands of molecules per second, but Rubisco can only catalyze of the order of about three molecules per second. It also can become inhibited re um, relatively easily. And that again comes at a cost to the plant because it then has to go about remove it, finding processes to remove that inhibitor to enable uh, further reactions to occur. And of most interest to me is that it also suffers from a lack of specificity because it can catalyze the reaction that we want with carbon dioxide, but annoyingly, it can also catalyze a competing reaction with oxygen, which causes a big loss to the plant. Now, plants try to overcome this inefficiency um, by building this enzyme in bulk. And would you believe it, um, up to 50% of the plant's protein is actually Rubisco? And it, sort of, it does this as some crude, I think, quite crude way to overcome these inefficiencies. But of course, that comes at a cost to the plant as well. All costs energy to make uh, proteins and, and enzymes. So I'm fascinated by this enzyme and in particular, whether we can improve upon this slow and, and, and what some might say promiscuous behavior. And as I said, given that photosynthesis is directly proportional to crop yield, any improvements that we could make in terms of photosynthetic efficiency would have a significant effect on crop yield. And one route that I'm particularly interested in is trying to look at how we can increase the local concentration of carbon dioxide uh, near Rubisco. And that would that's because if we increase the local concentration of carbon dioxide, we, min we maximize the probability of a molecule of carbon dioxide being uh, uh, reacted and we minimize the potential that a molecule of oxygen uh, reaches Rubisco and then undergoes a, a reaction.
Now, it's interesting because some species of plants have actually developed mechanisms that can do just this. Maize, shown on the left hand side here, is one such example. But unfortunately, these mechanisms aren't found in many of the common um, grain crops such as rice and wheat. Now, it's interesting that scientists are trying to use genetic engineering to, to engineer these pathways into these less efficient, so these, these carbon concentrating pathways into these uh, less efficient crops. And I think that um, this genetic approach is really exciting and really does have the potential to increase um, uh, crop yields. But it's also important to recognise that it's incredibly challenging because often what happens when you try to engineer a particular um, pathway into a plant, the plant uh, can in some way overcome or avoid that, um, that change that's being made. An analogy to, to, that might help us to understand that would be to consider uh, a roadblock. Now imagine that I'm an experienced driver trying to get to a particular destination and I drive along and I come across a roadblock. Because I know the, the area so well, I'd be able to navigate around the side streets and avoid the roadblock and get to my destination. And much in the same way, plants can often overcome the uh, pathways that are being engineered within them and actually more frequently and more typically uh, the changes are simply lethal and the plant dies. So we uh, and my collaborators are proposing an alternative strategy and it has uh, uses chemical approaches but it's also important to note that it's guided by nature we know that there are many plants and animals that have enzymes that are able to capture and release carbon dioxide and we're therefore synthesizing a suite of molecules that are able to resemble or mimic the behavior of those enzymes they're able to capture carbon dioxide and release it and the, the, the hope is that these chemical, these compounds will be able to spray, be sprayed on a plant, much like a fertilizer, and they would have the effect of increasing the local concentration of carbon dioxide around rubisco, and therefore would increase uh, the probability of uh, rubisco, of a molecule of carbon dioxide reacting within rubisco, and therefore increase rubisco's activity. Now, where are we in this process? So we've already managed to synthesize a suite of these molecules and we've shown that they're able to um, capture and release carbon dioxide. And we're, we're um, testing, we've tested their effect on rubisco that has been isolated from plants. So you can extract the enzyme out uh, from a plant and it can still function and you can test what happens when you add these compounds to it. And we've seen some really very promising results. One of the challenges, though, that still remains I, is how we are going to get these molecules to reach rubisco. Because if you can imagine, you spray the compound on the surface of the leaf or you put it in the water and it's absorbed by the roots. But whatever route it takes, it has to cross multiple cell boundaries in order to, um, and membrane boundaries, in order to reach the target rubisco. And what's interesting is that there's surprisingly little understood about the engineering rules that control how molecules cross um, membranes in plants. And so we've been working with uh, a group uh, run by Professor Oscar Sayers at Imperial College, the Membrane Biophysics Group. Who, and we've been developing novel um, tools that enable us to start to learn something about those engineering rules. And I'll show you a little bit about that, show, show you some uh, images from that in a moment. What I, I would say to this is that this is quite a common challenge in the agrochemical industry. And I, I do think it's a, a problem that we will be able to solve. So, we have been, as I've said, we've been learning from nature. We've designed a suite of molecules that resemble uh, uh, enzymes uh, that are able to capture and release carbon dioxide in nature, and we synthesize them. And, and we've 
tested, as I've said, them on, on, uh, on isolated rubisco. We've also been doing um, some theoretical studies, actually, to try to look at the surface of rubisco and see <coughs> where we can try and get these molecules to dock on rubisco surface without causing any detrimental effect to the activity that you're wanting to go on. So you can imagine you don't, if the enzyme has particular movements or motions that it needs to undergo, you don't want your molecule to interfere with those. So we've been testing regions um, on Rubisco surface to try to identify regions that we can particularly target. And as I've said, we're uh, undergoing, we're doing these what are called translocation studies, but these are really understanding these rules of how molecules can cross um, uh, different cell boundaries. And these, this is some images from that work. If you, uh, it's really quite neat, if you, as I said, this is work from, uh, in collaboration with uh, Oscar Sayers' this group at Imperial College. And here you have um, two water droplets in oil. And if you uh, add lipids, lipids to this solution, they uh, congregate around the interface between the water and the oil. And if you bring these two lipid water droplets together, you can see at the interface, these uh, two droplets actually zip, they, they sort of zip up together and form a lipid bilayer, which can, uh, and, and we can control the composition of these lipids so that they can replicate different lipid compositions that are found in different plants. Now, this image just shows you the scale of this. This is all chip technology. So you can see these are tiny chips that we've created that are, and we're able to manipulate these droplets to uh, form, uh, to zip up, to form these membranes. And once we do, and you can see we've, we've, we've uh, altered the composition of uh, the membrane so that they replicate different plant samples, be it tobacco, uh, Arabidopsis, oats, these are all plants that are very often used in scientific laboratories because of either, either ease of growth or, or for genetic modification purposes. And so we've, we've managed to create these lipid bilayers and then we can, you can imagine you can add uh, some of your compound, so in our case, these mimetics that we've been uh, developing and you can add them to one side of the droplet and you can watch uh, and monitor the absorption changes, the fluorescence changes, for example, at the other side. And you can see how the molecules translocate across those membranes and you'll find some get trapped some are able to transfer through easily some more slowly and you can start to learn something about the properties that are required to facilitate that translocation process it's interesting also to say that this technology was actually developed um, and driven by challenges in the pharmaceutical industry. And it was through the network that I, I'm going to come and talk to you about in, in a, uh, a moment, actually, that um, we recognise that actually some of these tools and technologies could be readily easily ported to challenges that were facing in the, were being faced by the agrochemical industry. And I think the group that was working on this thought that these engineering rules were very well understood in the agrochemical industry. And of course, that turned out not to be the case. And so it's really been invaluable in trying to understand what's going on. So the good news is that if we're able to increase the local concentration around Rubisco, we know that the plant won't try to bypass this effect, that, that, that effect of the roadblock won't happen because there have actually been experiments that have taken place that have shown that if you grow plants in elevated CO2 levels, and these experiments have been done in the lab, they've been done in larger scale glass houses, and they've even been done in the field, what you see is that you get increased rates of photosynthesis and increased yield. So this is really promising. Now, the work that I have tried to describe to you today, I hope I've got across that it really does involve multiple parties. So you'll, we have um, synthetic chemists, physical chemists, we have membrane biophysicists, we have biologists, plant biologists, um, biochemists and theoreticians and we're all working together on on this particular challenge and and I think that this really epitomizes the a way of working that's going to be essential if we're going to try to tackle the grand challenge of food security. Moreover I think it's really important that we work with end users and policymakers when we're developing new tools because only then are we going to be able to ensure that the technologies that we develop really are adopted and taken up by be it farmers, be it uh, um, um, 
uh, industry partners, for example. So it was really this recognition of this importance of the communication between different parties that led to me setting up a, 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 an international network called Agrinet. And as I say, I'd be really delighted if you'd be interested in uh, taking part in any of the activities that um, we host. I also um, uh, have uh, organized an Imperial College network and I'm director, a co-director of that network called the AgriFutures Lab. And both of them really focus on bringing scientists together from uh, along with industry partners, policymakers to work together on the uh, shared challenge of food security. And of course, communication is vital to uh, success. And it's really interesting because often, and you'll fi probably find this um, uh, and be aware of this, but communication um, between is often very challenging between people from different disciplines. So the language that I'm used to speaking as a chemist is potentially very different to that that's used by um, a plant scientist, for example. And it can make working at an interface quite difficult. And so you, you need to help and facilitate that. And that's why we set up these networks to really go get those discussions and conversations going at a, quite an early stage and try to forge links between different communities. As an example of that, so Agrinet was all about bringing together people from the agri-science community, which was really active, and the chemical biology community, which was also really active, but actually far more targeted towards health and disease driven challenges than agri-science challenges. And as I gave in my example previously, often the technologies that were being developed by that community had really obvious applications within the agri-sciences. So we set up the network to bring together these partners to really try to help to identify solutions to um, grand challenges. And, and we did this in a number of ways. We, um, we have a website um, which has a virtual networking environment built within it. We host a series of different meetings, including um, student seminars, outreach activities, as well as hackathons, creativity events and, and, and industry meetings and, and international conferences. So finally, I just wanted to finish and, uh, by saying that I hope that I have got across in, in this talk today that food security really does affect all of us. We've, I hope I, I, I've, I've got across, as I say, that we've heard how increasing the global demands of the food, fuel and fiber needs over the coming decades is gonna put immense pressure on the world's shrinking farmlands to increase their productivity. And I think that it's clear that innovation is going to be required and new ways of working that lie at the interface between chemistry and biology are going to be uh, essential if we're to impact upon this grand challenge. And just finally, I, I'd really like to acknowledge all the people that have done all the hard work um, within my group, the, the group of scientists uh, in the first two columns here are all um, PhD and um, postdocs who have worked with me and this list on this side are all the research collaborators that I am involved in and uh, uh, involved with and, and finally I'd like to um, acknowledge the funding that I have had to enable me to do this work which includes the Royal Society, uh, EPSRC, BBSRC as well as um, EU funding and uh, also some very fruitful collaborations with Syngenta. So uh, with that, I'd like to um, thank you. And I think we can take any questions now. Is, is that right, Rosemary? Yes, indeed. Thank you very, very much, Laura. Um, for the rest of you, I first heard uh, Laura give a similar talk to this, the Royal Society of Chemistry event. And as a, a biologist, I've done lots of chemistry. I, I was so impressed with what Laura's been saying about how important it is to work together, different disciplines, and to communicate and help one another achieve some solutions to problems that the world will face. And um, while the rest of you are thinking, please do um, type in a chat. And um, I would um, like to read out those, any, any questions that you have for Laura to um, help us with. Um, perhaps I, I can start off the questioning, if I might, while people are thinking. 
Um, you mentioned, um, or you applauded the work that the genetic engineers are doing in trying to solve some of these problems. And you hinted at the fact that that, that approach does have its own problems. Um, there are, there is also, sorry, some anti-feeling about things that are unnatural, um, because to many people <coughs> saying those very words uh, makes them feel a little bit, uh, if you like, anti that sort of technology. But do you, you yourself see your work or your type of approach going hand in hand with um, genetic engineering plants? I. I do actually and I, I think there are two maybe two answers to that question I think there's a real role for scientists to try to redress some of the what I believe and forgive me if people don't agree that who are on the call but what I believe are some of the misunderstandings that surround um, genetic engineering and I think effective science communication in that area is is going to be required um, to really try to change general public opinion on on that i think things are improving in that area but i think there's still quite a a long way to go but i do think you know we've got a um i do absolutely applaud the work that has been going on in genetic engineering and i i i'm very excited by that i, I think it's um uh, the ability it's it's and the, the scientists particular project that I'm thinking of the scientists are trying to engineer this carbon concentrating pathway into rice actually and um, I mean it would be amazing if that that was successful and I think that they will you know, I think it will be it is challenging as I as I alluded and I do think that chemical approaches will have a real role to play there and I think multiple approaches is probably the way forward when addressing the challenge of this nature. It's, uh, so, yeah, it's exciting work. But I, I think, yeah, science communication has a key role to play in this, too. Indeed. I'm just going to read out a comment from Dr. Stuart Inglestan Orm. Um, Many thanks for the very interesting talk. As you suggested, will plants using photolysis be able to provide green sources of hydrogen for future hydrogen cars without using electricity or natural gas? Gas, sorry, um, issues? Question um, mark. That's his thought, I suppose, that he's um, putting out there for um, us to yeah. think of. It's interesting. I think I, I'm not as. Um you know i'm not as knowledgeable on this area but i know there's a lot of work that um people are looking at uh, green algae for example that um can be uh a is is pretty is, is efficient and um they're using looking at ways that that can be engineered to um produce uh varying chemicals including uh high as hydrogen source i think most people working in this area area are, are really trying to mimic so there are a lot of um uh photochemists who are trying to mimic um the light reactions of photosynthesis and creating artificial cells for example that mimic the type of behavior that plants can achieve and i think what's really fascinating and important to bear in mind is that the reaction that takes place it's in a, an enzyme called photosystem 2 and this enzyme is is incredible, actually, because it achieves an, an amazing balance, both in allowing a reasonable level of efficiency, but also balancing highly reactive intermediates that are formed in that uh, in the reaction. And it's those highly reactive intermediates you you, you require a very high electro potential in order to split water, and so you have to create those that 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 environment create those those species to enable that reaction to occur but of course the surrounding protein has to balance that and and as a photosystem two gets around that because actually one of the the arms one of its um arms of the protein is actually turned over very rapidly because it gets damaged you know under excess light conditions it can get damaged very easily and so it it regenerates itself and of course that you know when you're an artificial <laughs> if you're working in artificial um photosynthetic systems you don't have necessarily necessarily have the uh, ability to to allow for that regeneration but of course combining maybe artificial systems and live systems can offer a route towards that and I think there's some nice work in that area. Okay so you're obviously impressed by that enzyme. Um, yeah 
I, no, I studied it, sorry. I, I, no, I, nowhere near as lousy as Rubisco, obviously. No. <laughs> just, just a question which may have sprung into many people's minds, actually. Um, it's from someone I have talked with in the past. So, uh, hello, Christine. As atmospheric carbon dioxide levels and temperature increases, will this also see a rise in photosynthetic yields? Yes, potentially it will. And, and um, it's interesting, I'm trying to do some modelling, or we're just starting doing some modelling to look at really what the levels would need to increase by to make a significant impact. So in principle, yes, you're absolutely right. So it could, uh, although increasing CO2 levels is not a, <laughs> something we would win, we want, but it's, uh, um, yeah, it will ultimately will increase, um, will increase yields. You're absolutely right. Right, okay. Uh, another one from Charlotte Flynn. Um, is Rubisco, Rubisco, I beg your pardon, the only inefficiency in photosynthesis? Mm, no, really good question, actually. No. So there are a number of different, I think it, for, for my mind, it's one of the main culprits, which is why I'm so interested in it. But for example, um, if you think of the light reactions of photosynthesis, there are some inefficiencies there in that the wavelengths of light, for example, that the pigments can absorb, they're, um, they're quite broad, but there are quite a lot of light is uh, lost that can't be absorbed by pigments. And so you have scientists that are trying to, uh, again, genetically engineer um, uh, pigments, chlorophyll molecules, carotenoid molecules into um, uh, plants species that can extend the spectrum of uh, light that can be absorbed to mitigate against some of those inefficiencies. Other areas include, for example, if you think of a plant, the structure of the plant, um, you um, leaves that are lower down often get shielded by leaves towards the top and again that can cause um, loss to efficiency so again the, the uh, scientists are trying to look at engineering plants so they optimize the efficiency of the structure of a plant to maximize um, efficiency on that route so yeah there are, that, that's yeah just a couple I could go on for, for more but in my humble opinion I think uh, Rubisco fascinated me most because it really is a terrible enzyme and I just wanted to know why it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, one more um, if that's all right does the genetic manipulation involve work with and pet carboxylase as in C4 plants? Absolutely, yes it is. So the, the scientists are uh, um, um, trying to genet uh, genetically engineer C4 pathways into, into rice. Yeah, it's exactly that, yeah. Uh, and finally, I think from me, unless um, Dr. Ingleston almost just said a thank you, but um, mm -hmm. Has anyone else got any other questions? Do fire one through. I've got a couple of minutes if anyone's um, got a burning question. I, I wondered how far off your current work is from actually being used. Um, how many years are you uh, thinking in your head it might be? Have you, you mentioned work in the field, but are you anywhere near actually using your sprays that you're um, imagining in field trials? I, I would say we're quite early on in that process as uh, you know we've managed to demonstrate that this works um, in vitro so we can isolate rubisco and we can see an effect and we've we have put um, compounds onto um, plants in, administered it to plants in various ways and we've seen some positive uh, results there we're now um are currently having discussions with um syngenta actually and we putting together an mta agreement that will allow us to send over some compounds that they can do some larger scale testing for us because of course we're you know it's they do this all the time it's so and uh, so we we've we recognize that it would make sense to to try to collaborate with industry on this um, so I think it could, and of course, you know, if we were, if if those results were positive, and if the results of those translocation studies that I was talking about help us tailor the molecule to really enhance how we can get these molecules across the different membranes, I think um, then all the safety and, and those aspects would need to go through. So we're quite a long way off, I think, before it can get into the field. But you know, it's. Uh, 
I, I, you know, you learn a lot on the way. So there's this ultimate goal for my research, but I'm all the time I'm learning and doing different side projects that, that, uh, you know, are, are generating a lot of interest for me. So yeah, it's, um, it's a long-term goal. I would say not a, you know, 10, maybe 10 years or so. I think not, not a short-term goal, I'm afraid. No, no, no. Um, it was like uh, an awful lot of research, isn't it? It's uh, a lot of slog and, and many years, but um, it, truly been very fascinating and um, I hope it's brought the photosynthesis that some of our students um, that um, are online today possibly with their members of staff um, have can actually see the application and the way that a lot of serious thought is going going into the process that is so fundamental to life on our planet um, and we'll just say um, that uh, Laura mentioned earlier uh, when she first came online about the virtual tours that mm -hmm. Imperial College um, are actually introducing. And, and they won't be the only universities, um, I'm sure, but um, at a time when it, it has been difficult for all you people um, actually at doing A-level or contemplating actually entering your A-level studies. It's, uh, it might be good or it might be fun to actually have a look at some of these. Anyway, I'll let you just say something briefly. Yeah, so we, um, I don't know whether it would be of interest, but uh, I was saying when I first joined the call with Rosemary that we've actually moved um, uh, buildings quite recently over the last three years or so to a building called uh, the Molecular Science Research Hub, which is where all our um, the chemistry department's um, research is now taking place and for those of you that that um, might be contemplating um, coming to Imperial um, we've put together a series of virtual tours that showcase what's going on in that building as well as what goes on at our South Kensington campus so obviously we'd very much welcome you all to come and visit us when that's allowed but uh, in the meantime if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about the types of things that go on at Imperial College um, please do take a look at those links. I'll try and send them through to Rosemary and, and then hopefully they can get circulated back to you if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. If you'd like to stop sharing, Laura, that yeah. might be useful. Um, and then um, we may actually see um, if everyone puts gallery view on. Um, yes, not quite sure why that hasn't happened, but... Uh, Anyway, thank you so much uh, to you, Laura, especially for a fascinating talk. And thank you to everyone that has come along today. Um, numbers are low, but as anticipated, we didn't know where we would be at this time <laughs> when the event was planned. But um, do come along tomorrow. Um, I hope some of you will, because um, tomorrow we have uh, Dr. Sam Horrell from the Diamond Light Source in Oxford. And he's going to look at um, X-ray crystallography and how a biologist ending up working at a particle accelerator. Mm -hmm. So a, a biochemistry per, uh, perspective today, very much so. But a little look about where physics touches biology, um, I'm sure will be uh, very interesting tomorrow. So I hope to see lots of you again. Um, and meanwhile, thank you once more to you, Laura, and to everybody. And... A bye and thanks, Laura, very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Take care. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.